Hello all, welcome to AETLS 2021, day two. Today's topic uh, of our discussions are basically rheumatological emergencies. And we are starting off uh, currently with a panel discussion about uh, hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, basically otherwise called as HLH. And we have assembled a panel of eminent doctors here who is immensely knowledgeable and has experience in managing HLH in their day-to-day -day activities. I uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Ranoi, Associate uh, Professor, um, Department of Internal Medicine, Amrita. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Neeraj Siddharthan, uh, Head of Clinical Hematology and Stem Cell Transplant, Amrita. And Dr. Midhun, uh, he is an Associate Professor in the Department of Rheumatology in Amrita. Today, uh, in the topic of HLH, we will start off the format of panel discussion as a five-minute monologues from our respective panelists, uh, detailing what, what is HLH, giving us an overview of HLH and how it affects uh, in special population, like in rheumatological population and in hematological uh, or in malignancy, population with malignancy. And uh, after a brief introduction from each one of them about their uh, experience with HLH in their own fields, Let's go ahead and discuss about the evaluation, presentations, and management of HLH individually. Once our pre-set questions have been uh, taken uh, and discussed about, uh, in the last 10 minutes of the panel discussion will be allotted to your respective uh, questions that you can put on our chat boards. And once the questions have been posted and uh, towards the end of that show, we can ask to our panelists about the relevant questions. So let's start today's uh, topic as such. I uh, welcome Dr. Ranoi uh, to kindly brief us about uh, what is HLH, basically. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think I'll uh, kick start uh, with uh, a few cases that uh, I've seen. Actually, this is uh, the latter part of uh, 2019. Same day, actually, two cases of uh, HLS actually had presented to the ICU. Uh, one, uh, a 40 year old gentleman, uh, alcoholic uh, uh, and hypertensive, uh, has uh, had a bleed with no residual, uh, I mean, interventricular bleed earlier, but with no residual uh, uh, def deficits, presented with a fever, jaundice, abdominal pain, and anuria uh, for the last uh, four to five days. Uh, actually, uh, uh, on presentation in the ER, the patient was found to be in high anion gap metabolic acidosis, was initially managed in the ER and subsequently shifted to the HDU. Uh, the initial investigation suggested a pancytopenia, uh, uh, deranged liver functions, obviously renal uh, failure, and a coagulopathy. Okay, so on high uh, uh, sus index of suspicion, we also ordered for the HLS panel, uh, which includes uh, a ferritin, uh, fi fibrinogen triglycerides, uh, LDH, and other things. And uh, to our surprise, the LDH, uh, sorry, the uh, ferritin was found to be about 84,000. It was very high. And LDH also was subsequently found to be very high, around 3,400. Initially, the fibrinogen uh, was within normal limit, but within a two days, fibrinogen also actually dropped. So, uh, initial suspicion, if in a patient present like this, a major differential diagnosis is actually sepsis with multi-organ dysfunction. In this patient, why we thought uh, beyond that, even though the procalcitonin was high, the CRP was high, was because uh, uh, of the multi-organ dysfunction syndrome that was there and the close differential diagnosis that was there and obviously the high ferritin that actually came in. The patient had a very stormy course and the patient uh, uh, developed uh, multi-organ dysfunction worsening, went into dialysis, uh, hypotension requiring supports, encephalopathy, uh, patient had bleeding secondary to the DIC, and despite treatment with uh, steroids and IV immunoglobulin, uh, patient succumbed on the fifth day. The another patient, the same day, presented with pancytopenia, an Ayurvedic doctor. Uh, he had uh, dengue to be uh, found positive. Uh, the pancytopenia was severe, so we actually had done a bone marrow here and also found uh, hemophagocytosis. And uh, uh, this patient required only a treatment with uh, 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 steroids 4-MG early and subsequently got discharged in a week or so. So this is the kind of spectrum that HLH can actually present with. The HLH, definitely, uh, the first one was a life-threatening disease. The one, the second one was not so life-threatening, but still could have become life-threatening if not uh, had managed in, uh, adequately. Um, so what is HLH? It's a life-threatening hyperinflammatory state. 
which is actually caused about because of a dysregulated immune response. Now, what it uh, does is it causes definitely multi-organ involvement and tissue infiltration and tissue destruction. There are different types. There are a lot of uh, uh, controversies on the types that are involved. The earlier terminology is called as primary as well as secondary HLS. Primary being the ones predominantly seen in children, which has a genetic uh, background, whereas uh, uh, secondary being anything which can actually be triggered by some other insult, whether it's an infective, an autoimmune, or an underlying uh, malignancy. So that uh, is uh, said. There are a lot of new changes in terminology of the divi uh, divisions or uh, subtypes cause, uh, called as um, HLH uh, uh, syndromes, HLS disease, and HLH mimics. HLS syndromes uh, close, uh, closely mimicking, mimicking the primary one and disease being the uh, secondary one. But however said and done, these things are probably going to add more confusion rather than actually solve the main problem. Why the change of uh, uh, terminologies were? Because infection and other things that are, which could be a trigger uh, could be present in the primary and secondary is pr pr predominantly because of those uh, particular triggers. So to avoid that confusion was these terminologies, but I think in my personal opinion, these terminologies can actually cause more confusion for a, uh, a normal uh, physician. Uh, so, uh, uh, with this basic, uh, uh, I think, introduction, I think uh, I will pass on the mic to uh, the next speaker. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mithun, sir, uh, can you please uh, describe to us what is actually happening in the body uh, on a HLH patient and uh, how a rheumatological patient uh, will present to with HLH features? Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, as Renoy told, HLH can occur due to either due to a primary cause, we, what we call familial HLH, or it can be due secondary to a, another disease, we call secondary LH, HLH. And secondary LH, uh, HLH can be due to either due to infection, that's the most common cause of secondary HLH. And other causes include malignancies and also the rheumato autoimmune rheumatological disorders. Among these, uh, uh, as I told, viral infection are the most common cause of uh, secondary HLH. Uh, what happens is that it is, uh, as the name, another name for HLH is uh, macrophage activation syndrome. Mm. Uh, why it is called macrophage activation syndrome is that uh, the macrophages gets uh, unregulatedly, it is uncontrolled activation of the macrophages. Usually, uh, macrophages, as you know, it's an uh, antigen presenting cells. Usually, it presents a foreign antigen like virus or something to uh, uh, it and it presents to the lymphocytes but and if it is not controlled uh, usually it is controlled by nk cells or cd8 cells and usually what it, uh, it actually uh, destroys the macrophages with the help of perforins if that mechanism is dysregulated macrophages will go on activated and macrophages is a source of inflammatory cytokines and there will be an unregulated production of cytokines, uh, inflammatory cytokines, which can cause uh, tissue damage. And the name hemophagocytes came from the uh, part that these macrophages can engulf the other cells, including uh, RBCs, uh, platelets, etc. That's why it's called hemophagocytosis. And uh, this secondary HLH is considered a fatal complication of uh, rheumatological disorders and the mortality is very high and most researchers use the term macrophage activation syndrome when a HLH occurs secondary to a underlying uh, autoimmune rheumatological disorder. As Renault told, there are a lot of terms which actually adds on to the uh, confusion but uh, this is the most commonly used, uh, macrophage activation is most commonly used when it is associated with a uh, rheumatological disorder. And uh, it can be, uh, uh, in rheumatological disorders, it can either be a first presentation of an autoimmune disorder. For example, I can say that in a Stills disease, they can present with macrophage activation syndrome. They can present with the typical features of the macrophage activation syndrome. And once you treat this macrophage activation syndrome, then only you can know that patient is having this uh, uh, Stills disease and we have to continue the uh, immunosuppression for Stills disease. And another second scenario is that in a all HLH occurring in a already known case of or established case of rheumatological disorder. The common example is macrophage activation syndrome occurring in SLE patients. And when uh, it occurs in SLE patients, it considered very fatal complications. We need aggressive immunosuppression. And 
uh, being said that uh, there are other mimics which can uh, cause similar type of presentations in uh, rheumatological disorders. The most common is the infection because the most of these patients will be on immunosuppressants. Therefore, uh, uh, the takeaway point is that any rheumatological uh, patient, a patient with an autoimmune disorder, presenting with a fever, uh, ongoing fever and the, the infections, uh, if you uh, able to rule out infections and then you should always consider the possibility of macrophage activation syndrome in those patients. Okay. And uh, uh, coming to the clinical features, uh, it is almost same as the uh, other uh, macrophage activation in other cases, but there are certain differences. Uh, seeing that, that some of the uh, manifestations of macrophage activation syndrome are actually co uh, common with the most, uh, some of the rheumatological disorders. For example, cytopenias, which we see in macrophage activation, can be also seen in SLE. And high ferritin levels, uh, is what, what we see in macrophage activation or HLH, can be also seen in Stills disease. Therefore, uh, and uh, similarly, uh, yeah, I'll tell you an example. In a, a patient with Stills disease, Stills disease can be either adult onset Stills disease, or a, it's the juvenile variant or systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Usually what we expect is thrombocytosis. The usual uh, platelet counts will be around 6 lakhs, 5 lakhs like that. If you get a reduction of approximately 50 percentage, like if the uh, patient's uh, platelet count reduces from 5 lakh to 2.5 lakhs, then also you should consider the possibility of macrophage activation syndrome. And there is a, the criteria actually most of us uh, uh, follow the protocol uh, the criteria, diagnostic criteria for HLH. Uh, but uh, for systemic onset JAA, there is a separate criteria. Okay. And in that, the cutoff for platelet count is actually 1.81. That itself shows the difference of this disease, uh, uh, the macrophage acti activation occurring in a rheumatologic disorder from a macrophage activation occurring in other conditions. And uh, this another thing is the ongoing fever, which SLE can cause fever. Uh, systemic onset JA or Stills disease can cause fever. And in that case, how we differentiate is that the fever in uh, uh, Stills disease is usually intermittent. And in between the fever episodes, patient will be uh, normal. Whereas in uh, macrophage activation syndrome, if macrophage activation sets in, this fever will become persistent. There will not be a gap. It will be unremitting fever, high grade fever, and patient will become sick. That means uh, previously, patient was in between the fever, the patient will be normal. Here, patient will be completely sick. General condition actually worsens. This is how we actually, it is actually challenging for a physician to diagnose macrophage activation in an already known case of uh, rheumatological disorder. And especially when it's the first presentation, it uh, increases the difficulty. Okay, so basically in a rheumatological condition, the presentation of uh, macrophage activation syndrome can uh, widely vary. From so it can widely vary, uh, it depends upon the underlying systemic disorder. Okay, so in any uh, rheumatological patient who is on immunosuppressant, we should be looking out for macrophage activation syndrome yeah. if there is no ongoing fever, yes, infection as such. Most of this, uh, if these autoimmune disorders like SLA or uh, Stills disease, these are the two common diseases which can present with HLH or macrophage activation. If they are present with a fever of long duration, which we are not getting any clue that and we, uh, all infective workup is negative, then we should always consider this thing and do the workup for HLH. HLH. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Dr. Neeraj, sir, can you please uh, enlighten us about uh, uh, HLH in malignancy patients? Thank you, Bharat. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, See, in, uh, uh, from the hematological perspective, uh, in, uh, we have uh, uh, two scenarios. One is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, some malignancies in which HLH happens. And also, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, you see the primary HLH in children uh, who are presenting. And primary HLH mostly present in less than one year of age. And, uh, they sometimes uh, uh, have a very fulminant course and uh, very difficult to diagnose early because sometimes they may be associated with immunodeficiency also. The other uh, scenario that we face is uh, um, uh, in adults uh, um, where you have a lymphoreticular malignancy. But mostly uh, the malignancies that we encounter uh, uh, with HLH is lymphoreticular malignancies. 
which may include uh, uh, lymphomas, uh, that is uh, both uh, Hodgkin's and uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, as well as leukemias. Uh, sometimes myelodysplastic syndromes also can uh, present with HFH. Um, here again, um, we see uh, sometimes there is a, a trigger. Uh, some of these uh, lymphomas have uh, underlying, uh, 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 you know, trigger uh, from Epstein-Barr virus. So HLH, uh, I should mention one of the uh, uh, important points that when we, we should uh, look for is a trigger, uh, infectious trigger, which uh, Renoy mentioned in dengue is one very uh, well-known infectious trigger. Uh, in, from our perspective, we see Epstein-Barr triggering the uh, underlying malignancy. We have currently one patient who has a high titer Epstein-Barr of 87,000 and who has been diagnosed to have anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, Epstein-Barr trigger is known in uh, um, Hodgkin's uh, very commonly, NK type cell lymphomas, uh, but other lymphomas also can be triggered by Epstein-Barr. From Asia, in general, there is a uh, there are various reports which put uh, Epstein-Barr viral trigger at about more than three fourths of the cases of undiagnosed HLH. Malignancy, it is important to diagnose malignancy presenting with uh, HLH, because as uh, Mithun uh, mentioned, it is just like in rheumatology, it is very difficult to diagnose. In in hematology also, when the patients usually present with cytopenia and hyperferritinemia. So there are a lot of differential diagnosis for such a patient. And often the malignancy will be hidden and HLH will be very much evident. So the malignancy is hidden and it is actually very hard to you know, dig out the malignancy. So we, uh, I think two important tests that we resort to in diagnosing will be one would be to tissue, bi uh, tissue biopsies and other, uh, especially looking at a whole body scans like PET, PET CT, sometimes which may give us a lymph node biopsy, you know, or, it is very important to diagnose a malignancy-related HLH as early as possible because the outcome of a malignancy-related HLH is much worse. Actually, the average survival of a malignancy-related HLH is maybe weeks if it is uh, undiagnosed compared to other causes of other causes of HLH may actually go on for a little more time. But if you don't diagnose a malignancy in time, that can be very fatal. So. Um, the treatment also is a little bit tricky when uh, when you when you deal with a malignancy related HLH, because HLH uh, once uh, you don't you, you don't have time for uh, you know to, to wait for a malignancy diagnosis. You may have to actually start treating an HLH while you are trying to diagnose the malignancy. You start immunosuppressives. You you start uh, 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 you know you may start drugs uh, um, earlier and that may also interfere with the diagnosis of uh, you know uh, malignancy, malignancy uh, especially the lymphomas so yes it is uh, um, quite uh, challenging and um, um, unfortunately uh, as we talk in, uh, you know we do not have a, a you know a great solution uh, how to approach a malignancy related hlh but a few things that i would uh, 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 say from our experience is that uh, go early for a, a, a whole body a PET scan, a clinical examination, you know, to dig out any lymph nodes when you first, and uh, sometimes uh, you may have the B symptoms uh, preceding the HLH coming, so the patient may have been unwell for a few months, so a little bit of history, a good examination, and, uh, you know, and go for an aggressive investigation right from the beginning so that you don't waste uh, time in diagnosing that. So in hematological, also like rheumatological, the it can be hidden, well hidden uh, condition that triggers the HLH, and we'll be treating HLH in without understanding that what is triggering it up uh, in the front. That's what Sarah is yeah. telling. Okay, uh, like uh, um, any predisposition factors is there for the patients, like uh, anything that. Um, the patients can understand or we can understand from history that this patient is more uh, prone for HLH as such. See, for, this can be said about, uh, I think, for the congenital uh, uh, HLH. Congenital HLH is often uh, triggered, by, I mean, it is, it is inherited as an autosomal recessive. 
Okay, so if one child has uh, in the family has a history, this this may come in the you know in a in a pediatric uh, perspective. Then if one child has a history of uh, HLH in the family, and then there is a twenty five percent chance that another child in the family may be predisposed uh, to uh, uh, developing a HLH. So that uh, that apart, um, I think uh, another thing which we don't do uh, is looking for HLH. We don't do routinely, but there are certain studies which have looked at uh, 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 trigger uh, triggering mutations. If you in, inherit a, inherit mutations, heterozygous inheritance of mutations may actually predispose an individual to uh, uh, developing HLH. We don't actually pursue that uh, we don't, uh, uh, very actively. Okay, but a family history uh, of uh, similar history is there. We yeah, should be yeah. more keen yeah, yeah. Uh, into thinking about HLH yeah, as such, yeah. is, isn't it, sir? Yeah. But in uh, rheumatological disorders, the most uh, important risk is the disease activity. If, the, if disease activity is not properly controlled, that is itself is a risk factor for uh, getting a macrophage activation syndrome. The common example is the Stills disease. Stills disease, if your disease activity goes on, it uncontrolled disease activity, that can pre itself precipitate macrophage activation. Other factors as uh, near at all is infections. Okay. And malignancy can also occur in rheumatological disorders. Okay. Sir, uh, so if at all, if uh, uncontrolled disease activity can cause HLH, can acute flare-ups of rheumatological uh, diseases can also predispose a patient to have HLH? Like, can it be like a refractory, like multiple HLH episodes and, and can Uncontrolled disease there? activity can be, it can be due to either not taking the treatment or patient on treatment not responding to, to the treatment. And as you told, you were asking about the flares, no? Yes. As a, like a patient who has been already treated for HLH, after uh, some years or months later, if they again get a bout of acute flare-ups... That as, get... as Neeraj told, if there is an underlying some genetic mutation, that is possible even in adults, not okay. only in children. Okay. That is possible. Otherwise, it, if the disease is well, usually we don't see it. Sir, uh, Renu, sir, in the same time, as we told, uh, viral uh, infections are most common. Is it uh, only viral or um, can we get in other bacterial yeah. or any See, other like, infections uh, the, the first case that I presented most probably would have been a bacterial sepsis syndrome. So similarly, a lot of bacteria, we have seen actually cases with tuberculosis, uh, uh, the seal infections, all actually uh, presenting with that. Most of the bacteria can actually present, but it's very, very less. I think the predominant uh, ones actually which cause the trigger uh, is uh, the EBV infections and other viral infections. Uh, uh, most commonly, I think HIV also is one actually which can actually cause significant. Having said that, uh, the other parasitic infection, fungal infections can also cause it. But again, those cases are actually quite uh, less. Uh, I think when you say about infection, I think we have to talk about COVID here. I think uh, the cytokine storm that we say in actually COVID uh, is probably a part of uh, HLH. Okay, but uh, the, the, uh, as practicing uh, in COVID ICUs and COVID wards, what you've seen is all the manifestations of HLH are not there in uh, COVID. Predominantly, it is the respiratory system that is involved in, which we already know that probably is because of the COVID itself, the COVID-19 itself, the direct effect of the virus itself on the thing. But having said that, certain features of cytokine storm and HLH are actually fitting in, and uh, we have to actually study more whether the COVID-related, uh, this one is also a part of uh, HLH itself. Because the treatment that we are using are all again immunosuppressive agents, so maybe we are not actually uh, uh, seeing a good response. I mean, the, the actual uh, HLH, HLH kind of a flare. Before that itself, whenever there is a mild uh, desaturation, we are starting steroids up front. So, uh, sir, uh, continuing, can you uh, kindly tell us what are the main clinical features, like uh, either signs or symptoms, in a patient uh, for whom we are thinking about HLH? What are the cl clinical signs and symptoms which will help us to uh, think about or make a diagnostic criteria yeah. uh, for uh, HLH? Uh, uh, the certain things which are already a part of the diagnostic, the HLH 2004 criteria, but I would just uh, say the fever, uh, a fever which is actually lasting for some uh, time, probably is one of the most important features associated with organomegaly, whether uh, predominantly splenomegaly, but even hepatomegaly and lymphadenopathy. Generalized lymphadenopathy can also occur in uh, these individuals. Uh, if there are uh, certain organ involvement, I mean, patients can actually present with uh, uh, 
uh, encephalopathy ataxia and other uh, things like that sometimes isolated involvement of the cns is there predominantly with the uh, familial variant rather than actually with the secondary variant uh, uh, other organ involvements uh, uh, in the form of anuria like the case that i presented acute kidney injury can occur so uh, it depends on the kind of uh, systemic multi organ dysfunction syndrome that is there uh, those clinical uh, features come in the general features definitely include a fever uh, 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 organomegaly in the form of hepatosplenomegaly lymphadenopathy and other things like that so, uh, so the, uh, similarly, you were saying that uh, ferritin levels will be very much elevated in HLH and we'll be sh um, seeing a sharp rise along with uh, bicytopenia or pancytopenia. So, uh, even in MO um, MODS, uh, we can see elevation in ferritins like in yes. the 800s, 900s. So, uh, is there any cutoff value which will point us towards HLH or uh, any ferritin level more than 500 should we think about HLH as such? Uh, as you know, ferritin is acute phase reactant and it can be elevated in other uh, inflammatory conditions. I already told, even in systemic uh, onset JA or still CCC, it can be more than thousands. Therefore, but if the if it is more than 10,000, the specificity actually increases. Okay. But at the same time, the uh, sensitivity comes down. Our aim is here to treat, uh, diagnose it early and treat early. Therefore, uh, yeah, as per the uh, criteria, more than 500 is the, they have put because to find out more cases and to start on treatment early. Therefore, uh, very high levels actually in very few conditions, we usually we see very high levels of ferritin. That means in multiples of 10,000 that you should see, like as Renoid 12 first case was 84,000. That type of cases. Where only a few conditions which can cause that much high levels are the one is fulminant hepatic failure, and sometimes in iron overload condition, the hemochromatosis can cause. Other than that, very few conditions cause. Uh, but uh, if it is in thousands, like 2000, 3000, we need to rule out other causes before telling that patient is having macrophage activation syndrome. We have to see other clues also, like cytopenias. A falling cytopenia and another important clue not always present is the falling ESR sometimes ESR uh, may be high in initially like for most commonly in systemic uh, in rheumatological disorders usually the ESR may be on the 80s or 90s if there's a sudden fall and there's a general condition worsens that indicates patient is going in for macrophage activation the sudden fall in uh, ESR is due to the hypofibrinogenemia Okay. Yeah, that is also a clue. Okay. Even if the ESR falls, the CRP will be very high because of the inflammation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so in a patient who we are clinically suspecting HLH, uh, how should we go about uh, diagnostic uh, method? What, what diagnosis uh, tests should we go ahead to confirm it and uh, think about further okay. treatment? So. Uh, Taking, um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, continuing from what Mithun has said, now that f criteria for uh, HLH diagnosis, uh, that five out of eight criteria yes. that you have, uh, was originally proposed uh, for a pediatric population to diagnose, have a high index of suspicion to diagnose uh, primary HLH. So uh, the five out of eight criteria um, of uh, actually doesn't. Uh, is not that very sensitive for um, adults also. Adults, you don't have to actually fulfill all the five criteria in adult. You may not actually. The patients may not fulfill all the criteria. So sometimes uh, some of these investigations are also not available okay, in the leukin levels of uh, uh, soluble CD disease. So all these are not available also. So uh, one uh, tissue, I mean, so tissue biopsies sometimes take uh, take time. So in a patient who is presenting with fever, the, so the general picture in an adult uh, who presents with, when you are suspecting an uh, um, HLH will be an unwell patient uh, who presents with a fever of, uh, uh, I mean, reasonably long duration, probably more than a week or so, and uh, who would uh, generally have an altered uh, liver function uh, test also, and then you will have a cytopenia. Mostly they would have a cytopenia, and they will have a hyperferritinemia. And the hyperferritinemia, again, uh, I think uh, is very confusing uh, uh, because uh, this combination can also be seen in uh, sepsis. So how do you differentiate between sepsis, uh, uh, the, 
uh, big problem. So you may have other markets of success, sometimes also elevated, CRP also may be elevated here in um, um, HLH. So in a cytopenia, of course, you go for a bone marrow biopsies. Uh, that you may get a bone marrow aspirate report in 24 hours. And uh, if you have any malignancy, you will know that. If you, sometimes you may get hemophag hemophagocytosis, that macrophage, I mean, the ingestion of the other blood cells by the macrophage seen on the bone marrow aspirate, which will make the diagnosis easier. 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 But it need not be there always. Sometimes you may have to rely on the ferritin also, ferritin with cytopenia. So in that case, uh, how do we monitor? So we probably monitor ferritin very closely. One, uh, one thing we generally do is, which we have found helpful is that we ferritin, monitor ferritin closely in the everyday we monitor. In a sepsis, it has got, usually got a kind of a static pattern or, or it will be a slowly rising pattern. But in an HLH, you will have a logarithmic rise. In, uh, so like you have a ferritin of 2,000 one day, it may be 10,000 the other day and it will go up to 30,000 the third day. Then you know you're not dealing with sepsis at all. It, 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 it is probably HLH that you're dealing with. Mostly on examination, you'll, you'll find a organomegaly, as you know, I mentioned, mm -hmm. mostly it is planomegaly, but sometimes it may be hepatomegaly. So that's the uh, com uh, combination in which we usually make the diagnosis. And uh, other tests like triglyceride and the elevated triglycerides, which sometimes may or may not be there, but a low, ferret, a low fibrinogen always, uh, you know, mo mostly helps us uh, in, in confirming the diagnosis. Um, so, uh, so what are the, like if we diagnose with the criteria, we are diagnosed the patient to have HLH, what is the specific treatment that we can provide to the patient for uh, improvement of HLH? It will again uh, depend on what HLH you are dealing with. Now, for a dengue HLH, for example, I think steroids work very well. And as uh, Rinoy mentioned in his opening case, mm -hmm. he is treated with dexamethasone and works very well. Uh, but uh, for a rheumatological cause, I think Mipin would be the best person to tell how to uh, uh, approach. But uh, for uh, for an undiagnosed, I mean, you don't have a trigger. And for a malignancy, of course, you treat the malignancy. Because if it is Hodgkin's lymphoma, you treat the Hodgkin's. That as a, that will be the best treatment that you can provide. But if you don't have an uh, malignancy, if you don't have an obvious uh, uh, infection. Uh, infection trigger, and if you don't have a, mal uh, a no case rheumatological, rheumatological cause, then you generally have to treat with an we treat with an HLH protocol. Uh, in adults, we treat at HLH with a dexamethasone, cyclosporine, and etoposide. Okay, sir. So etoposide is usually spaced uh, uh, in four doses in two weeks as an induction, and cyclosporine is also given uh, from day one and. Uh, it, dexamethasone is also given on a high dose for uh, initial uh, two weeks, and then it is step by. Okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, in case like uh, Dr. Ranesh sir told that uh, there will be CNS uh, manifestations for patient, or a patient can present it, uh, with isolated CNS with the thing, is the same tri uh, same treatment for this thing that we are giving regime. Well, uh, you know, I. I haven't come across this isolated CNS uh, manifestation, but uh, I think uh, etoposide has a penetration into the CNS. Dexamethasone has penetration into the CNS. Cyclosporine may not be a good option for a, a, a CNS uh, um, uh, HLH. Do we use uh, intrathecal methotrexate and hydrocortisone? Is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it can be it used. Can. We, we, methotrexate uh, is useful for HLH uh, in general, but uh, not I'm, I'm not coming yeah. across that. Uh, business, uh, similarly, in rheumatological cases, like uh, as you told, Stills disease with HLH, uh, what is the treatment protocol? Is it similar to what Neeraj has It is slightly different from the uh, as, uh, normal HLH protocol because uh, in most of these cases, patient may have to continue the immunosuppression on a long-term basis not only correcting the uh, HLH. And the first treatment is same, is high-dose steroids. What they usually prefer is we give, usually give IV methylprednisone pulse for three to five days. And usually secondary agents are needed in most of the cases. Secondary agents means secondary immunosuppressive agents. Uh, that depends upon the underlying uh, disease. Rheumatological disease. Rheumatological disease. For example, in a patient with uh, uh, Stills disease, uh, uh, it presents a macrophage activation syndrome. 
the recent studies shows that anakinara it is a il1 antagonist a monoclonal antibody and it is found to be very useful and uh, that is uh, usually helps to solve the uh, macrophage activation but the problem is that even if you uh, macrophage activation comes down we have to continue uh, treatment, rheumatology treatment, treatment. but uh, anakinara is not available in india that's a one major issue we have successfully used another monoclonal antibody like tocilizumab in some of these rheumatological conditions and like in uh, one recently there was a patient with sle with lupus nephritis with a macrophage activation which is not responding to high dose steroids and cyclophosphamide also patient was on cyclophosphamide for lupus nephritis in that patient actually we tried tocilizumab based on some case reports and patient improved but even if that improved the lupus nephritis and that persisted we have to continue with the cyclophosphamide monthly pulse for 6 uh, that is a difference actually uh, once uh, this usually we don't use etoposide if a patient is not responding i will take help of neeraj and neeraj will take <laughs> give the etoposide and uh, for the viral associated i forgot to mention that the viral associated uh, sepsis hemophagocytosis vih uh, hlh uh, no viral associated IVIG can be yes, quite, yes. quite very useful. That okay. In okay. immunological condition also, IVIG can be tried, but problem is that the cost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, while infections, it is very useful. Okay. Sir, uh, a doubt from my side actually. Uh, since the most debilitating factor in HLH is basically the cytokine storm that is affecting all over the uh, systems, uh, is uh, any modern dialysis method like cytosol absorption and all can uh, make a difference for this patient? I don't think so. I don't think there has been any... Um, um, anybody has... No, no, no. I just yeah. asked from my <laughs> side any... But there is, uh, as the, uh, there is a new drug actually to mention. Uh, Empalumab is a, um, a that interferon gamma uh, ag ag agonist which uh, blocks interferon gamma and that has been approved. It's not available in our country. But uh, that's one new FDA approved drug for HLH. It's then, probably only save time, no? If you absorb all the... It's ongoing yeah. inflammation. It's no? ongoing inflammation. Yeah. It's unregulated and unchecked. So you have un to un check so that. You do check that. It's going to be... This is just yeah. absorbing, maybe, maybe buying some time. Yeah. I don't know. But more than that, uh, I mean, pathophysiologically, I don't think it will yeah. work. Uh, Ranveer sir, in the same time, what are the supportive care from a critical care viewpoint? What are supportive care mm -hmm. can we provide? Supportive to care definitely, I think is very important. I mean, uh, uh, specific therapy and supportive care. I think uh, supportive care definitely you have to take care of the usual critical care aspects. I mean, uh, uh, antibiotics, especially prophylactic antibiotics. If you are thinking pneumocystis gerulosi should be actually covered, uh, antifungals should be added, especially in patients who are actually having impending neutropenia and things like that. Uh, antibiotic in the form of uh, an anti pseudomonal cover as per hospital uh, uh, infectious uh, disease uh, protocol, as well as probably an MRSA cover needs to be added. Uh, having said that, the other uh, supportive management should include uh, uh, transfusions, platelet, as well as uh, PRBC transfusion. Ideally, should keep uh, HB around 8 and a platelet somewhere around 50,000. So, I think you have to transfuse accordingly. Uh, leuco uh, radiation as well as it, uh, it is better to prevent uh, aluminization and uh, uh, transfusion associated GVHDs is better to do uh, uh, those modalities. Uh, and uh, another thing that uh, uh, routine uh, symptomatic management in the form of if the patient goes into hypertension, definitely you have to give anaerobic support. So all other critical care support including nutrition and other things are important. Even in a non-critical care situation, certain things are important. If the patient has got bleeding, sometimes an unrecognized bleeding is actually a pervaginal bleeding, menstrual. Yes, yes. So I think it's better use a hormonal uh, therapy and actually suppress it. I think it is important. And no vaccination in the next uh, uh, six months because we do not want any kind of an immunological trigger. So that has to be there. And another thing specific to critical care you uh, said is actually should we use uh, low molecular heparin or uh, heparin. Uh, for uh, DVT prophylaxis because of the sig significant bleeding risk that is there and uh, probable DIC that is ongoing, uh, intracranial bleed uh, is something that is uh, uh, we have to be careful about. So I think uh, routine ones have to be uh, uh, avoided, but if there is an obvious uh, DVT, then obviously DVT or pulmonary thromboembolism definitely we will have to uh, act accordingly. Um, sir, uh, in the treatment, um Post this treatment, uh, what are the factors that will, like we started HLH treatment, uh, like corticosteroids and uh, 
drugs, uh, how will we know the patient is getting better? Like what factors will point towards a betterment in patient condition? One is uh, uh, improvement in the cytopenia. Uh, so that, that of course, uh, the, uh, uh, but it's uh, uh, a little bit uh, difficult uh, uh, to assess response purely based on cytopenia alone because some of fever. the drugs that we fever, yeah, yeah, yeah. fever other general condition yeah. will also improve. Yes. Okay. Um, patient subjective feeling, yes, subjective improvement is uh, important. Uh, fever coming down, but. Sometimes we may be complicated by secondary infections also. Mm. So uh, clinical, yes. Uh, then uh, monitoring of the lab parameters are also, also to be very intensive. Okay. You are looking at the platelet improvement is one of the good signs. You know, without transfusion, if the platelets are improving. Uh, the other thing is your ferritin monitoring. You, know, yes. you, you have your ferritin uh, serially monitored and it, it, it improves. One other, uh, well, uh, less recognized, but an improvement uh, which we can take is the hyponatremia often is associated with HLH. Right? Mm -hmm. Improvement of sodium is often a good sign. Okay. Uh, LFT is often very variable, and uh, but uh, uh, bilirubin uh, takes more time to come down that uh, usually we see, we see later. And uh, another early sign that we may find is uh, the fibrinogen improving. Uh, um, uh, but uh, uh, having said that, uh, uh, these can be transient also, perhaps. Yes. So sometimes we may find there is an early improvement, uh, but uh, we may not be able to sit back and relax because that early improvement may be seen. It may be only, you know, the next day it may get reversed. Or once so, you taper the yeah, steroids, yeah. it, it may just taper. Uh, yeah, it may just relax. So, it is still very, uh, I don't think we have uh, mastered the art of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, successfully treating HLH in the majority of the patient. We still lose half of our patients. Yes. So, uh, like that, that is one of the questions that has been told, uh, asked, um, what is the prognosis uh, that we can give to the bystanders? Uh, like a patient getting admitted to critical care and the bystanders asking, uh, about this disease and this is not a very commonly known disease as such what is our realistic prognosis that we can give to them how should we convey the disease severity is one of the questions asked in our chat boxes dengue i think generally mostly is treatable very well Hematological conditions also to an extent i think it is uh, treatable but an idiopathic hlh 50% uh, uh, mortality i would say malignancy associated hlh uh, the mortality may be even higher yeah, higher so basically, a significant mortality risk is there, and we have to convey that clearly to the bystanders. Yes. Similarly, sir, as you were telling that uh, we, once we treat also the patients can um, worsen in next coming days. Um, a refractory HLH, other than the what we told, is there anything else we can offer? Yeah. So hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is sometimes considered for a, a you know a refractory HLH. Okay. Uh, it's uh, uh, very difficult to select a patient for hematopoietic stem cell transplant in the adult uh, because mostly you will have a lot of secondary factors uh, complicating it. Uh, but um, uh, recurring HLH is most common in the pediatric uh, age group. Because so of the genetic. Because of genetic predisposition. So there, a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is uh, offered based on the mutations and the response. If you have a response to the initial treatment before the treatment, child relapses, uh, the child is advised to go for a... So once the uh, HLH is treated completely and uh, then yeah. the child has to be yeah. evaluated yeah. and yeah. further yeah. thought about. Yeah. In adults, I think if you have one, I mean, if you have a very good initial treatment and we may not transplant the patient, but then if you have a relapse and the relapse is, uh, you know, very aggressive relapse and once you get them into a second remission, we do offer a transplant. Uh, sir, uh, similarly, as you are told, uh, there is thrombocytopenia, bicytopenia, thrombocytopenia in HLH associated with the um, DAC, a hypofibrinogenemia and DAC. Uh, is there the DAC protocol that we use for treatment and severe sepsis good enough in HLH also or uh, should we be aggressively correcting DAC in HLH? In general, uh, no, we don't have to aggress. I mean, uh, even in DIC, uh, unless the, I mean, you must be following the bleeding protocol. Yes, you know? bleeding. bleeding. So unless the um, unless the bleeding uh, uh, unless there is a bleeding, we don't usually transfuse uh, 
platelets, uh, platelets prophylactically unless it's lost less than 10,000. Huh? No. Otherwise, if there is bleeding or if there is any um, um, uh, anyway, procedure, then we transfuse. Otherwise, we would rather uh, do like other chemotherapies where we wait till the platelets are less than 10,000 or um, uh, five. I mean, but uh, FFP also it is similar. We don't usually prophylactically give FFPs. But fibrinogen, uh, I think, uh, you know, because of the fibrinolysis and the risk of uh, a major bleed like Renoi mentioned, that one, I think, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we would transfuse cryoprecipitates to keep it um, above 100. Above 100. For a hypo, severe hypofibrinogen. Severe hypofibrinogen. Similarly, uh, there is no role for any antifibrinolytic uh, therapies or a factor 7A and all is not at all indicated for a not bleeding patient. Not bleeding. regularly indicated. So, uh, sir, we'll just go to the questions that is posted by our um, audience. the questions is basically uh, what are the drugs that uh, if rheumatological drugs uh, disease modifying drugs um, what we can give in a HLH patient is one question that has been asked I think they have missed what we have told earlier can you okay. can repeat that and the uh, primary treatment is basically steroids hydrosteroids and uh, I think hematologists prefer Dexona we usually give either person not, not much difference almost say but the when it comes to uh, the refractory because sometimes most of the rheumatological disorders they may need a secondary agent basically uh, because of the underlying uh, autoimmune condition and in those cases uh, one of the commonly used secondary agents is cyclosporine for uh, um, HLH and as I previously told like in Stills disease uh, anakinra is found to be very useful and in even tocilizumab which is also a monoclonal antibody found to be very useful in uncontrolled uh, disease activity due to systemic onset JA. <laughs> and we uh, once, other thing is that once after the IV steroids, high dose IV steroids, when we change to oral steroids, usually what we give, we give a divided doses. Morning, the, we usually give 1 milligram per kg in divided doses. Uh, what, otherwise, what we usually give is uh, once daily dose because to avoid the, reduce the side effects of steroids. In this macrophage activation syndrome, usually give a divided dose. These are the usual differences. And the other further immunosuppressions dep depend upon the underlying condition. And as Neeraj told, IVAG also tried, but it was uh, given a mixed response in rheumatological disorders. And these biologicals, Anakindra has the most uh, SP, uh, uh, evidence for in macrophage activation syndrome. Anakindra is a usual, is a drug used in refractory stills disease although not available in India. And there are case reports for tocilizumab for to use in uh, uh, macrophage activations. Okay. And uh, in Epstein Bayer virus, I think rituximab they have tried. Uh, Rani sir, uh, similarly, uh, one question is basically in uh, dengue uh, patients, in patients with dengue fever, is uh, bicytopenia, a severity of bicytopenia alone uh, should be, uh, should give uh, us into thinking of HLH or any other factors is what they are asking. I know, I think, uh, see, whenever there is any, uh, I mean, bicytopenia is usually seen in uh, dengue fever, isn't it? So, I mean, uh, basic leukopenia and uh, uh, thrombocytopenia is definitely seen. But usually it is actually the uh, uh, polycythemia, probably secondary to hemoconcentration that is uh, the usual uh, feature of uh, uh, dengue. So, here, if there is a fall in uh, hemoglobin as well, as well as uh, hyperferritinemia uh, and uh, uh, other clinical features which fits in with probably an expanded kind of a dengue syndrome, then I feel definitely it is important to actually look at HLH. HLH. Yes. Uh, similarly, steroid, hydrosteroids that we use in HLH, um, the other uh, complications of steroids, as we have earlier told about a um, suppressed Im immunity uh, with antibiotic coverage and uh, other complications steroid that we are going to manage like a hyperglycemia we are going to manage with insulin infusion 
Yes, uh, even in rheumatological disorders, the trigger for the macrophage activation can be a infection. Therefore, even if you diagnose macrophage activation in an autoimmune condition, there may be a coexisting infection which have precipitated it. You have to look for it and it's always better to cover for it broad spectrum antibiotics and always send cultures even if you su suspect a macrophage activation clinically. And you, are, you, may, you have to give steroids because otherwise we lose the patients. We have to actually balance that act. So hyperglycemia secondary to it. That also we have to be a supportive care. Uh, we have insulin to infusions we can support. Yes, yes. And in uh, critically ill patients, I mean, HLS can be a stable patient and also a critically ill patient. And critically ill patients, other than cultures, another thing is PCR-based uh, panels, I think, uh, yes, yes. definitely is important. Because yes. we need a diagnosis first. Yes. And that situation, I think it is definitely important to actually uh, make sure that you send that also. It's costly, but I think uh, definitely it is important. Uh, worth the risk. Yeah, worth the risk. Dear sir, uh, similarly, uh, what they have asked is uh, whether the patients, after complete resolution also, whether they have... Um, present again with a relapse that we have uh, already told that uh, mm -hmm. uh, adults as well as pediatric population ha has a tendency to relapse in pediatrics which, which then we can think about a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, adults very unlikely to relapse but if it relapses then we have to uh, treat in the same manner itself, isn't yeah. it sir? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, more, more likely uh, that the pediatrics are relapsing and uh, Adults also have to be closely followed up, and uh, if they're showing signs of uh, relapse, uh, then uh, uh, we would work them up towards... Uh, and also work doing a genetic mutation. Yeah, definitely. At that time, we would definitely look at the genetic mutations, because we'll be very curious why they are relapsing. So, serum ferritin should be done every day uh, is what yeah, we need it, it, it can be very individual protocol. There's no, uh, there's no, there's no rule or guideline like it has to be. I, am, I was just telling the, it can, it need not be done every day. Once you start, re, before, before you decide whether it's such a match, I think it's, it's good if you can do it. I mean, if it's, if it's on that borderline. To understand the uh, right. To understand. And if it's first value, the last patient we had, first value was 8,000. Then we repeated it was 18,000 and the third day it was 26,000. So we know, okay, now this is galloping up. Yeah, yeah. So we, that helps us take a decision. But once you take a decision and then once you start treating the patient, I, I think we, we, we are on a full protocol. So we're not going to look at uh, ferritin that frequently. That drastic yeah, change. Yeah, yeah. So we, we would wait and do once in uh, uh, two, three days and uh, see whether the patient is responding in that. Most of the literature is saying that this high ferritin at presentation or actually sudden jump in between the width, that is a bad prognostic. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. Yes, I think we have covered all the questions uh, coming into the uh, chat boards as such. Uh, anyhow, I thank. Um, Dr. Mizun sir, Dr. Neeraj sir and Dr. Ramesh sir for being a part of ATLS and uh, being a panel, part of the panel today. I hope all of our audiences got a, a wonderful session and got a really good uh, experience out of this panel discussion as such. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Brother. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good learning for all of us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because we can get to know from each other.